It's time to start living inspired with Trisha Goyer. And now, here's your host, Trisha Goyer. Welcome to Living Inspired. I am so glad that you're here today, and I'm excited about my guest and just discovering God in new and deeper ways. And how do you see Jesus? How do you see him in your life? How do you see him in your community? How do you connect with him? We see Jesus through service, but also we see Jesus by sitting at his feet, by connecting with him. And it's amazing when we talk about these real life subjects and talk about people and serving and loving God, we always think of people around us and people who are really making an impact. And have you ever thought of biblical characters that way? Have you really just put yourself in their shoes and let their stories really come to life? Well, if you haven't, then the author I'm talking about today has done that in his new book. So let me tell you a little bit about God's favorite place on earth and author Frank Viola. Now, Frank has helped thousands of people around the world deepen the relationship with Jesus Christ and enter into a more vibrant and authentic experience of church. He has written many books on these themes, including From Eternity to Here, Revise Us Again, Reimagining Church, and Finding Organic Church. And today, like I mentioned, we're going to be talking about his brand new book that just released and is actually on the Amazon bestsellers list right now. It's uh, God's Favorite Place on Earth. So welcome, Frank. Oh, thanks so much, Tricia. It's an honor to be on. Really big honor. It's so great to connect with you. I know we connect online and email and Twitter a lot, and it's so great to hear your voice. And, um, you know, I, just, I love the book. Um, and I mm. love how you've been able to just step us into this God's favorite place. And I'm going to have you explain where that is, but really take us into some of the biblical characters. Um, so tell us a little bit about why you chose to write this book in the way you did. Great question. You know, the book addresses many struggles that we Christians face, mm -hmm. uh, and these are struggles that I have had in my own Christian life. And so I wanted to weave a story that was found in the Gospels that's been very moving and very touching and very instrumental in my own life, bring that story into 3D high definition, and in so doing, doing address all of these struggles. There's actually 18 <laughs> that I go into, and uh, readers and listeners can go to godsfavoriteplace.com to just see all 18. Of course, we won't talk about all of them. Yeah, it's the story of a little village that was the most important place for Jesus Christ when he came to this earth. It was actually his favorite place. It was actually the only place, Tricia, where he was received. He was rejected everywhere else. Right. Lots of people don't know the story because it's kind of scattered about all through the Gospels. But what I've done in this book is I've put it all in chronological order and blowed it up real big so you can see it and told it through the viewpoint and on the lips of Lazarus. Mm. You know, and it's so great. I mean, you have to tell us where God's favorite place is because it's one of those, once you start, once I started reading your book, it's one of those uh, topics that at dinner that night, I'm like, do you know where God's favorite place on earth was? <laughs> and it's, I, I love that because it just takes us, you know, these stories that we think we, think we know so well, um, mm -hmm. and it just puts us there. So explain a little bit about why you think that's God's favorite place. <laughs> Sure. Okay, here's the story. Colossians 1 tells us that God created all things through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So Jesus is the creator. Well, there came a day, we all know this, when the creator penetrated his creation. And Jesus showed up. God in flesh came to planet Earth. And at the very beginning, from the womb to the tomb, he was rejected in every quarter. You know, when he came to Bethlehem, there was no room for him. So he had to be born where animals were fed. His own hometown, Nazareth, did not receive him. They rejected him. Jesus made the comment, a prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown. Right. His brothers and sisters didn't even believe on him. Tried to go in Samaria, and uh, they rejected him. And finally, Jerusalem, you know, of all places, the city of God, they not only rejected him, but they crucified him. Mm. And, you know, Jesus made this statement in the Gospels, foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So just think about that. Here's the creator of all things visible and invisible, and when he shows up, He's rejected everywhere. The right. creation rejected the creator. But thank God there was only one exception. A little, humble, tiny, obscure, unknown village two miles away from Jerusalem called Bethany. 
And it was the place where the Son of the only place where Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, could lay his head. It was home for him. And he spent the last week of his life there. There was a precious family there, beautiful family that the Gospels say he loved deeply and passionately. And so God's favorite place on earth is a place you would never expect, this little unknown village called Bethany, but so precious to him. Jesus spent the last week of his life in Bethany. In fact, Tricia, many people don't know this, but he ascended into heaven from Bethany. Mm. The scripture says that was the last soil on planet earth that touched the feet of our Lord. It was in Bethany. And the point of the book is God's looking for a Bethany again. Mm. a place to lay his head. He came to his own, and his own received him not, but Bethany received him. And he wants every heart to be a Bethany, and every home to be a Bethany, and every church to be a Bethany. And in the book, I talk about what that means and what it involves. And uh, it's just a moving, moving story. When you put it all together, of course, told from Lazarus' perspective, uh, there are parts in this book, Trisha, I just lost it. You know, I was weeping. (laughs) And and what's interesting, too, about that, you know, okay, so you write a book and you cry, and I'm sure you're an author, you know about that. But I'm getting letters from men, grown men, telling me, I made a mistake reading this book at work because I've fallen apart. I'm a mess. So when you hear that... It's so humbling, and you say, Lord, Lord Jesus, you breathed on this. This is beyond what I can do. Absolutely. Well, I want to hear some of those parts. What were the parts that really, I mean, because there's so many times, and you know this, and I know this, when you're writing, when it seems like God takes over, <laughs> and, it's, and, and his spirit is there, and it's so real, and you feel the words. Tell, tell us about. One of the places that really grabbed me was, uh, well, there's several, but one of them was the death of Lazarus. He's on his sick bed. He's very sick, and Mary and Martha send word to Jesus, and they say, the one whom you love is sick. Mm. And that was their way of saying, this is serious. Right. We need you to come. He sends word back, and here's what it is. Everybody needs to listen to this. This is what Jesus said in the message. This sickness is not unto death. Now think about that. How would any reasonable person interpret that? <laughs> yeah, Absolutely. Right? He's not going to die. He's not going to die. (laughs) Well, guess what? Shortly after they got that message, Lazarus is gone. And one of the things I do is I paint a scene where there's three men, friends of Lazarus, around his deathbed. And one of them is a guy who says, basically, Lazarus, I grew up with you. We went to synagogue together. And I just want you to renounce your faith because the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a myth. He's never come through for us. He did not deliver us from our oppressors. The Romans are still hammering away at us. He's not real. I want you to forsake him before you die. And then another one says, Lazarus, I disagree with this, but you have to understand the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is real. But this Jesus of Nazareth, he's deceived you. He is not the Messiah. If he was, he would be here. Where is he now? Right. And then you have the third one. And we all met this person. I disagree with these two. I believe Jesus is the Messiah. Lazarus, just like you do, but you're sick because there has to be some sin Mm -hmm. in your life. And if you would find out what that sin is, then God would heal you. Right. And Lazarus looks at him with tears in his eyes. He can muster up the last breath. And he says something to them, and I can't give it away. (laughs) (laughs) You have have to go get the book. (laughs) But this is what happens. He passes away. And he's writing it. So I use these words. He says, and at that moment, I died. And the lights go out, and then you see Mary and Martha throw their bodies on him. They're weeping. They're wailing. And they're disillusioned. The funeral happens right away. That's how they did it in the first century. And Tricia, if a very close friend of the family did not show up to the funeral, you know what that meant? That meant a slap in the face to the family. It was an embarrassment. It shamed the family. And Jesus wasn't there. And so (laughs) the funeral is over, they're weeping and wailing, and now four days later, Mm. after they receive the promise, this sickness is not unto death, guess who's outside the village of Bethany? It's Jesus. And Martha runs out to him, she falls down at his feet, she's crying, she's angry, and she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then (laughs) Mary comes following says the same thing. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And just think a minute, how many times in our own life, Lord, if you had been here, my son would not have. Lord, if you had been here, (laughs) my mother wouldn't have. Lord, if you'd been here, this wouldn't have happened. And they're upset and they don't understand. 
And you know what? To them, Jesus did not fulfill his promise. Right. And well, we're going to, this is a perfect way to end it because we're going to pick it up in just a minute. I'm talking to Frank Viola. We're talking about the new book, God's Favorite Place on Earth. We'll be back in just a minute on Living Inspired. And now, back to your host, Trisha Goyer. Welcome back to Living Inspired, and I'm Trisha, and I'm talking to Frank Viola. Now, Frank is the author of many books. He's also written articles and has been interviewed by publications such as Time, Christianity Today, Charisma, Life Today, and you have to check out his blog, um, frankviola.org. It's one of the top ten most uh, popular religious blogs today, and I always enjoy reading it, and I have friends, too, that will say, have you read Frank's blog today? <laughs> so mm, be wow. encouraged by that, you know, and I wanted to share a little bit of um, a review, because this is what we were talking about right before the break. We were talking about in our own lives, we feel sometimes like, where are you, God? How mm. come you aren't here? And um, Joy Bennett, the blogger at Joy in This Journey, wrote, Frank Viola's new book, God's Favorite Place on Earth, couldn't have reached me in a better time. I've been grappling with the pain of being rejected, misunderstood, and judged by other Christians for a few years now. I had no idea how dangerously bitter I'd become. Frank's book spoke directly to my heart, giving me much-needed perspective on the way God reconciles these difficult experiences, both in Jesus' life, in the flesh, and in ours. And I just love that. I love how we're able to take stories and take words, and these are meeting real people and touching their hearts in real ways. Um, and, I mean, isn't that amazing that, you know, here you are, God is using you to go out and share these messages of hope. What was your main goal um, that you wanted to get across as you sat down to write this? Okay, if, I, if I, my reader will take away one thing, what one thing would that be? I want them to see that God wants one thing above everything else, and it is he wants to have a Bethany on this earth again a Bethany where the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, can lay his head and be at home. And when we do that, Tricia, when we understand what it means to properly receive Jesus, fully receive Jesus, and all that it implies, just like Mary, Martha, and Lazarus did, then guess what? We have what we're looking for, and that is we're looking for home. We're looking for friends that receive us. You know, I talk a lot about rejection in this book, and that's what Joy Bennett was speaking of, because Jesus tasted rejection before it got to us. He knows what it feels like to be rejected by fellow Christians now. You know, it wasn't the Romans that drove the six-inch nails in his wrists that hurt him the most. It was God's own people that rejected him. I was wounded in the house of my friends, and he managed to go through that rejection and it not lead him to bitterness, Mm -hmm. but that it instead beautified him. Well, he was perfect as it was, but he learned through his sufferings, Hebrews says. And you know, when we are suffering, taking the bitter pill of meeting a God that doesn't meet our expectations, or meeting a God that doesn't seem to fulfill his promises, like Mary and Martha, as we talked about in the last segment, you know, this sickness is not unto death. Speaking about Lazarus, well, guess what? Lazarus died. When we're suffering like that, we want to explanation but God wants to give us a revelation of his son and Jesus will always surprise us if we hold on (laughs) and we don't in the face of doubt and human perplexity and this doesn't make sense and why did they do that and why God did you let that happen if we can just say with Martha when she met Jesus at the edge of Bethany when he was coming four days late now (laughs) you know Lazarus body's decomposing and she said if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. And then she, then she remembers, and she holds on the last shred of faith, and she says, but I believe that you are the Christ, mm. the son of a living God. I don't understand what happened. I don't know why you weren't here. I don't know why you missed the funeral. I don't know why you didn't fulfill your promise. But I believe anyway. And that's what he said. The resurrection and the life, do you believe this? She says, yes. And then Jesus Christ, as he always does in our lives, will come leaping over the hills in some unexpected way that we can't even imagine. And he will write straight with crooked lines. Mm. And, you know, the Lord, sometimes he delivers us from trouble. 
but very often he delivers us through trouble. Right. And, you know, there's great lessons here, great lessons here. So much bound up with this family of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and how much Jesus loved them. And he wanted friends. He was a human also. He was divine, yes, but he was also human. One of the remarks that I really have been touched by is that people say, this book made Jesus so human, so real. I can relate to him now. Because he feels what I feel. Absolutely. And I think just the way you were able to fictionalize it. Um, now, was this your first time ever writing fiction? <laughs> Listen, Trish, I'm going to make a confession here. Uh, <laughs> I don't read fiction. My wife, she can't read nonfiction. Right. So that tells you a lot. She's married to a nonfiction writer. So if I give her a book, she, she can't even get past the first chapter, you know. But somehow... The Lord enabled me to write from the viewpoint of Lazarus. Mm -hmm. I I know my limitations, so I had Eric Wilson, who's a New York Times bestselling author. He wrote Fireproof and Courageous and Facing the Giant. He's a great friend of mine, yeah. Okay, there you go. Well, he helped me. (laughs) I said, I don't know how to describe this scene. Can you help me? And he he was so helpful. But uh, somehow the Lord managed to do it. And when I got the endorsement from you, you know, I fell out of my chair. This is like one of the top Christian fiction writers in the world, (laughs) you know. And then Mary DeMuth, I told my wife as many times, this is way beyond what Frank Lola could write. I know it is. And I'm just humbled to see how God's using it nevertheless, you know, from a guy who doesn't even read fiction. So it's just really interesting to see it all coming together like that. Absolutely. And I just love how it just, like you said, just brings it to life. And I think people are getting that. How to get hold of the peace and presence of the Lord in the midst of your worst storm. Mm. And, you know, Mary and Martha, that was the, the worst day they ever lived to see their brother die and the way he died uh probably the next one runner up was when they lost jesus you know when he was crucified but another one would be how to trust god when he doesn't meet your expectations Mm -hmm. how to trust him he doesn't even seemingly fulfill his promises i know there are people listening that have stood on the word of god and claimed the scripture and said lord you said this i'm standing i'm believing and then it doesn't happen and this is where a lot of people bail out. You know, they just say, well, he's not real, you know, Mm -hmm. or they're angry at him. You know, they still believe he's real, but you don't love me, Lord. (laughs) Right. So they just kind of turn cold. And all of this is in that story. And it's coming straight from Lazarus' perspective. And I think the Lord really helped me to kind of get in his skin and, and write the way that he saw things. And and one of the things, too, that I think will help people is that I talk a lot about Mary and Martha, and I have a totally different view on these two women. I mean, to me, they're awesome women. But Mary is my hero. She's my hero. Mary of Bethany, unbelievable. Okay, I want to hear more about this because that was my next question. We have these caricatures of Mary and Martha. You know, we, we have it in our mind, and we've heard them preach, and they almost become like cartoon characters or, you know, the, yeah. the good one, the evil one, the busy one, the worshipful <laughs> yeah. one. Tell us a little bit about, you talk about Mary being your hero. I want to hear more about that. Martha, first of all, is a gem. She is highly observant. She is somebody who is always looking to care for people, looking after their needs. She's a hard worker. She's hugely hospitable. And um, she loves Jesus. There's no question. But in the beginning of the narrative, this changes later, but in the beginning, her identity is so wrapped up in her service that she is very critical of others who do not serve like she does. And I have met Christians like this, Tricia, where they serve and serve and serve, and they say yes every time, you know, the pastor or the elders need something. Yes, 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 yes. And, of course, if you're a yes person like that, you'll burn out quick. Right. And sometimes they get so... They get so tired, and then they look at people whom God is blessing who doesn't serve the Lord, isn't even serious about the Lord, even a fraction of what they are. And then they they not only burn out, they bail out, and they say, Mm -hmm. God, why are you blessing them more than me when I'm doing all this for you? You see, okay, Mary... She is a worker, too. She's in the kitchen helping Martha. You know, a lot of times we hear, well, it's all Martha working, and Mary's just off in heavenly land, and she doesn't really care about practical things. No, the Scripture says she's there helping. But something happened when Jesus went into the public room, which was only reserved for men, by the way. Mm. A lot of history in this book I weave in. She's looking over there, and she's saying, I want to be in on this. Mm. I don't care what anybody thinks. I want to be in on this. So she goes into the public room, which she's not supposed to do. Only men are supposed to be there. And then she has the audacity to sit down at the Lord's feet with the other disciples. Right. That's a double scandal because Jewish rabbis did not have women disciples. Mm. 
And she instinctively knew that Jesus would be okay with it. And he was. And when Martha stormed in there with smoke blowing out of both ears and chided her sister, what she was really saying is, Lord, don't you care? Right. My sister is acting like a man mm. when she's a woman, and she should be back here helping me. Wow. And you know what the Lord does? He defends her. Yes. And she does not defend herself. This will play out again in the future when she takes her precious ointment and an alabaster, the worth of which is $50,000 in our standards. She takes it and she, quote, unquote, wastes it on the head and body of Jesus. She intuitively knows he's going to die soon. She's preparing him for burial. And once again, Mary gets chided and rebuked, this time by the disciples. And once again, she doesn't defend herself. Yeah, there's so much in this book. And our time is up, which is so sad. But no. definitely check out God's Favorite Place. It's available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble, your local Christian bookstore. You are going to be blessed by this book. Thank you so much, Frank, for being here today. My honor. 